Welcome, guys. Um, I'm assuming a lot of you guys are first years. Welcome to MD Anderson, and welcome to the core curriculum. I'm Dave Hong. I'm actually a third year medical oncology fellow here and help organize this class with Dr. Freireich. And uh, just wanted to give you guys a little bit uh, an overview of what the purpose of the core curriculum is. Uh, the core curriculum was started about six years ago, really to give all the fellows at MD Anderson uh, a broad perspective on, on cancer medicine and cancer oncolo oncology in general. And so <clears throat> the first part of, of the core curriculum, <clears throat> which will run until January, you'll hear different perspectives on uh, really a clinical perspective on different tumor types from GI to lung to breast, uh, the surgeon's perspective, the radiation oncologist's perspective, the, the medical oncologist's perspective. And we'll also cover different areas of oncology, including palliative care, uh, clinical ethics, et cetera. The second block, which will be begin sometime in January, will really cover uh, specifically the science of oncology. We'll cover what, you know, what is a phase one, phase two, phase three study. We'll cover uh, topics such as tumor genesis, metastasis, and immunology. And uh, you know, we have some of the top researchers in this institution and, and uh, our sister institutions come here and speak about uh, really the general topics in these areas. Um, what, uh, what I'd like you guys to do when you do come here, uh, we, we try to start around 515. There's usually gonna be a sign out sheet in the back and one that's just kind of circulating, if you could uh, just fill that out. Um, the attendance, supposedly for most of your <laughs> rotations, are, this is a required course. Um, and uh, we ask that you can, you know, try to make 75% of uh, uh, of the of the core, and if you do, you get uh, you will uh, be credited, and that credit will eventually can be applied to a uh, uh, master's course, and eventually there will be a PhD clinical course that's actually begun here, and that can be applied towards that also. Um, please also try to fill out the evaluations that will be either online or in the back, um, that will also be added to towards your uh, overall attendance. Um, today I just wanted to introduce uh, our core curriculum with uh, not only the director of the core curriculum, but also uh, just a, a legend in his own right. Uh, Dr. Emil Freireich, if you guys don't know about him, is truly one of the giants of, of medical oncology. Um, some of his accomplishments, he was one of the first to develop multi-drug chemotherapy. Um, he helped set the standard for uh, therapy in child leukemia and actually was probably one of the first to uh, develop uh, uh, chemotherapy for child leukemia, which is one of the most curable cancers to date. Um, he also developed platelet transfusions, white cell transfusions, um, was one of the founding members of the American Society of Clinical Oncology and also uh, started the JCO. So, Without further ado, Dr. Freirich's going to talk really today about oncology in perspective of medical history, but also how MD Anderson fits into that uh, role. Dr. Freirich. Thank you, David. Uh, he did all the introduction I was going to do. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna, this is not going to be a boring history talk. I, what I'm going to try to do is uh, put uh, oncology in perspective for you because I think young people uh, have difficulty perceiving uh, how contemporary our knowledge is. You don't realize how much that we teach and know wasn't known a very short time ago. So that's what I'm gonna try to get done in this lecture. Uh, I've just put some highlights up here that I'm gonna address the first one is, uh, it's hard to believe that the first surgery was done only 200 years ago. The Royal Marsden Hospital in England was the first institution formally dedicated to cancer treatment. And in 1884, the Memorial Cancer Hospital in New York was started, a hospital devoted to cancer treatment. 1889, Rentkin discovered x-rays. That's for visualizing. In 1905, they learned to treat skin cancer with radiation therapy. So 100 years ago, 
radiation therapy began. 1909 was the first Society for Clinical Investigation uh, research in the clinic was something that was carried on largely in Europe. And in this country, as you know, being a young country, uh, there was very little in the way of academia. But uh, the academic professional societies began in 1909. And in 1910, the famous Flexner Report was issued. And the Flexner Report, Flexner was a PhD who worked for the National Academy of Sciences. And what he did was visited all the medical schools in the United States to see what they were doing. And it turned out these were all apprentice type training programs. That is, the way you learned to be a doctor was you followed a doctor around. So it was largely anecdotal stuff and very little science. But by 1910, the sciences of physiology, anatomy, biochemistry were flourishing in Europe. And what the Flexner Report did was recommend that medical schools have a formal training program in the basic sciences. And ever since 1910, as you know, our medical schools have basic sciences in the first two years of your training. And all physicians are trained not only in the clinical, but in the basic sciences. In 1910, the first clinical research establishment in the United States was formed. That was the Rockefeller University in New York. The Rockefellers realized that the kinds of things that were coming out of Europe, science in medicine, was a thing of the future. And they built an institute which is still functioning continuously today as Rockefeller University with a very small hospital. 1913, the American Cancer Society. 1914, the Texas Medical Association actually formed a commission on cancer. It was only the second one in the United States, the first one being in Pennsylvania. 1914, World War I. For those of you who don't remember, I guess it didn't occur in your lifetime. 1920 was the first time women voted in the United States. Imagine, it was only 85 years ago that women were not able to vote. 1922, insulin was discovered. 1925, the first television. And I was born in 1927, so we had television. Imagine living without television. How dominant it is in our lives. In 1926, the Pondville Hospital was founded in Massachusetts. That's, a, again, an institution devoted to cancer treatment and research. 1928, penicillin was discovered, but not practically utilized until the Second World War. 1929, the Great Depression. Everybody was out of work. Uh, I was two years old at the time, and uh, they were very tough times, believe me. But the 41st legislature of the state of Texas created a center for the insane, cancer, and pellagra. It's a nice grouping. It tells you what the public health problems of 1929 were. Pellagra was the number one cause of major illness in the south of the United States. Of course, insanity, cancer, two of those that are still with us. In 1930, uh, it was discovered that pellagra was a deficiency of B vitamins. The person who discovered that was a public health service officer in the United States Public Health Service. And as a consequence of that discovery, the legislature of the United States decided that public health was the mission of the federal government. And they created the National Institutes of Health, uh, which contained, was operated by the United States Public Health Service. And the first major triumph was the eradication of pellagra, which occurred because the rice was shucked. And if you leave the husks in, you get the B vitamins, and that cured pellagra. By 1937, the legislature realized that the National Institutes of Health had to focus on a newly emerging problem, cancer. The first disease-oriented national research program was in cancer. That is, the NIH was designed to treat all disease, but the legislator recognized the importance of cancer in 1937. 
And of course, in 1941, the famous World War No. 2. Now we'll get closer to MD Anderson. 1941, the 47th legislature of the state of Texas appropriated $258,000 to begin the cancer hospital. In 1942, a lot of people want to know why we're called M.D. Anderson. It's not got anything to do with the degree Doctor of Medicine. M.D. is Monroe Dunaway Anderson. And Mr. Anderson was a uh, cotton magnet. And the cotton industry was very large in Texas and still is. We're the leading cotton producing state in the United States. And the cotton was all bundled and shipped out of Galveston which was the leading port in the United States. And uh, Monroe D. Anderson made a lot of money in cotton. And he was without family, no children, and no descendants. So when he died, he left his fortune to this foundation. And the board of the foundation had to do some good for Texas. And uh, the MD Anderson offered to match the legislative appropriation of a quarter of a million dollars with $250,000. And when you think of the budget of our institution today, it's, it's uh, pushing $200 million. The MD Anderson Foundation for $250,000 was guaranteed the right to have the naming of the hospital, MD Anderson Cancer Institute. And that has stayed to today because it was in the initial agreement. So that's how we got to be MD Anderson Hospital. Uh, Dr. Bertner was the first internet interim director. Uh, you see his name on Bertner Avenue in the medical center. Dr. Bertner arranged to purchase the Baker estate. And this is the father of James Baker, who as you all know is the Secretary of State in the United States. His father owned this piece of land and it was purchased for the MD Anderson, it was the first location of the MD Anderson Hospital, six acres. They recruited four PhDs from UTMB and a business manager. There were no physicians yet, 1942. 1943, they organized a clinic. This was with volunteer physicians who operated out of the Herman Hospital. As you know, the Herman Hospital was the first institution in the Texas Medical Center. And the building, which was started in, uh, I don't know the exact year, 20, it was in the 1820s. Uh, that building has still been resurrected and, and it, the rest of Herman Hospital is built around the original building. So if you haven't gone to see it, it's worth walking through the corridors. It's exactly as they were when the, build, the hospital was built. So MD Anderson now is a clinical institution. Well, in 1944, uh, Several real estate developers, uh, Jones was one of the leading guys, decided that Houston was going to be a major city and that needed a major medical center. So what they did was they purchased the land, which is called the Texas Medical Center today, just empty prairie, adjacent to Herman Hospital. And to build a medical center, so they said the first thing you need is a medical school. So being Texans, they decided, well, we'll buy a medical school. And they did. They bought Baylor University, which was associated with Baylor University. It was located in Dallas. And they purchased Baylor Hospital, lock, stock, and barrel, the entire faculty, and they built a building in the medical center, which the faculty moved into. And that occurred in 1944. The atom bomb in 1945 ended World War II. And in 1946, Dr. Lee Clark was appointed the first permanent director. And Dr. Clark is really responsible for building this institution to what it is today. Dr. Clark negotiated 22 acres for MD Anderson in the Texas Medical Center where we are today. Another important thing happened in 1947. Now remember, the war ended in 45. 
before the war, during the Roosevelt administration, the, the Department of Health passed a law saying that the National Institutes of Health, which was located in Bethesda, Maryland, just north of Washington, which had a bunch of basic science laboratories, really needed a hospital because they recognized that the presence of sick people would drive research toward the clinical problems that the country had. We had a cancer institute, but they were studying cancer in animals and tissue culture. Well, they didn't have tissue cultures yet, animals. And they were studying samples, but there was no hospital. So they created a hospital, but World War II interrupted that. The funding disappeared. And at the end of the war, 1947, the Congress created the clinical center with legislation. They appropriated money to build a hospital on the campus of the National Institutes of Health. Now that's very important because the clinical center becomes the first major full-time clinical research institution in the United States and very important in my career. 1947 transistors, very important to our future. Most of you don't know, but I give a talk for the uh, physician scientist program on clinical research, but I just like to remind people that the first randomized trial was published in 1948. So although we call that the gold standard and we think it's old stuff, it's really very modern, 1948. Less, it was only 55 years ago that the first randomized trial was published. It was a trial of comparing uh, streptomycin to placebo in patients with advanced tuberculosis. A very important paper to read. 1948, Dr. Farber described the first anti-metabolite, the first effective treatment for any systemic cancer, and that was the drug, an antifolic acid drug, methotrexate, which was published in the New England Journal. 1949, corticosteroids, also active in children. 1949, I got my MD. Now, the reason I put that up there is I like to tell young people that everything that I know and do in the practice of medicine and in research on cancer today was not known when I got my MD. So just remember that what you're taught in medical school is very primitive stuff. It's a foundation for what you're going to learn during your scientific career. So I put my degree up there because my career now covers 55 years and everything I'm talking about from now on happened during my lifetime, during my professional lifetime. While I was a physician licensed to, quotes, practice medicine, I hate that term, to perform as a physician. 1951, six mercaptopurine, the second important anti-metabolite. George Hitching, Gertrude Elian got the Nobel Prize for their work on developing antipurines. And in 1954, the first patients came to this location in the medical center. And that, so that MD Anderson, you see, is only 50 years in this location as a hospital with patients. 1955, it says NCI, that's when I was inducted into the Army and stationed at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda in the clinical center. And it began my research career in 1955. 19, and I'll come back to that because I'm going to talk about some of the things that have happened in my lifetime. Uh, in 1959, the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences was created in Houston. Prior to 1959, the graduate students had to travel to Austin to get their exams for their degree. But we then created a graduate school, so now we had MD Anderson, there was a UT Dental School, and we had a graduate school. And that's very important to our presence here today. 1965 was the year I came to MD Anderson Cancer Center. Now, in the decade that I worked in Bethesda from 55 to 65, as David has said in the introduction, American medicine was revolutionized by the presence of the clinical center at the National Institutes of Health. Speaking specifically about cancer, what we accomplished in that decade was, as David said, we developed multiple agent combination chemotherapy. It was based on the combination therapy regimens that had been worked out for infectious diseases. 
We also applied the randomized trial technique to cancer research for the first time, 55 to 65. We formed the first cooperative group of multiple institutions. We formed the first objective quantitative criteria for response to a treatment. We formed the first flow sheets, criteria. We did formal research. And the reason that all happened at the Cancer Institute was because the first medical director at the Cancer Institute, my boss who recruited me, Gordon Zubrod, had worked during the war in the malaria program. The malaria program was like the atom bomb project. It was a crash program because more Americans were dying of malaria in the war against Japan in the Pacific than were dying from bullet wounds. So they had to control malaria and they established a crash program. They got all the brains in the country together and they developed a screening program with malaria in a pigeon. They developed a phase one trial. They did randomized clinical trials. They developed the chloroquines and they actually controlled malaria. And many people give them the credit for winning the war in the Pacific by controlling malaria in the American uh, soldiers. So uh, in addition to all of that, uh, as David said, we developed supportive therapy, platelet transfusions. We developed the blood cell separator, which was, is proving to be quite important even today. And uh, we developed and proved that a systemic cancer could be cured with systemic treatment. Prior to 1955, no one believed that cancer that had spread outside of the local and regional area could ever be cured. And the reason was that the cancer derives from a cell which is syngeneic with the host. So the idea was how could you develop a chemical which would dissolve the left ear and leave the right ear intact? I mean, the cancer is just like the body. So where is the basis for specificity? But as you now know, uh, chemotherapy is a major uh, component of the treatment. In addition to radiation and surgery, chemotherapy is a major discipline. That all happened in that decade. Well, in 1965, uh, Dr. Fry, who was my immediate superior, and I were at the peak of our young scientific careers. Uh, we had an enormous program. We had unlimited resources. We had recruited lots of patients. We had claimed the cure of a systemic cancer. Things were going famously. Now, why would we leave the ivory tower of Bethesda and come to the swamps of Houston? In 1965, Houston was the last place to have endemic malaria. This is literally swamp country, as you know from your short experiences here. Hot and humid all the time. Air conditioning made it a civilized place to live, but before air conditioning, you couldn't live in this community. Why would we come to Houston? Well, there were two reasons we decided to come. Uh, the major reason was the National Institutes of Health is a full-time research institute like the Rockefeller University, but we had no students. There was no medical school. There was no graduate school. So the flow of young trainees who kept the enterprise dynamic was coming largely because of the physician draft that is military people who were young and assigned to work at the NIH. We saw by 1965 that that stream would shoo, soon stop. And uh, Dr. Clark was a great recruiter and Dr. Clark was watching what was going on in Bethesda and he decided that instead of having an institution that had a good clinic run by well-trained physicians who practiced Mayo Clinic type specialty multidisciplinary clinics, and a research institute that was staffed by PhDs who worked on the basic sciences of cancer, that he needed to have what we had developed at the clinical center. He needed to make this a research institute by having a group of physician scientists who could bridge the gap between the laboratory and the clinic and do clinical research per se. So Dr. Clark got on his horse, came to Bethesda, interviewed Dr. Fry, actually convinced him that his future was here, that Houston was going to be a great town, we were going to have a medical school, it was all going to be under the MD Anderson, we were going to have a major health science center. And Dr. Fry decided to come in 1964 and I followed in 1965. 
Dr. Clark had already had the, now the original hospital is just the little bit of the institution that you see with pink marble. It's a very tiny, tiny hospital. Dr. Clark had recruited from the Lutherans sufficient money to build a new hospital, the Lutheran Hospital. But 1965, there was a horrible event. In Vietnam, as you know, we got involved in an ugly war. And from 65 to 75, federal funds were diverted from health sciences into the military action as they're being done today. And after the war began, uh, the Texas legislature had created the funding for an additional medical school in Texas. But, and the coordinating board had decided it would be in Houston, the governor's coordinating board. And subsequently, the legislative block from West Texas uh, created a bit of a coup and they moved the medical school to San Antonio. So the medical school we were supposed to have in 1966 was not in Houston, but in San Antonio. So we didn't have a hospital. We didn't have any research base. We didn't have uh, a medical school. And here we were in Houston. And we had to struggle to get going. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we did from 65 on. But I'll just finish this little bit. Uh, finally, in 1969, when things cooled off, the legislature created another medical school. And it was placed here in Houston. And it's now uh, our medical school. Now, 69 was a very important time for the medical center because Dr. Clark envisioned the University of Texas Medical School being in the same administrative line as MD Anderson because we had a dental school, a graduate school, a public health school, and now we had a medical school, so we would have a complete health science center. But unfortunately, for reasons nobody knows, the legislature created a health science center and separated MD Anderson from the health science center. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So the medical school was in the University of Texas Health Science Center. It still is. It's a sister institution. Had its own president and its own line. 1969, the moon landing. 1972, Dr. Fry left to go to Harvard, and I became head of our department. 1978, Dr. Clark retired after 32 years of chair. 83, the Clark Clinic. And Dr. LeMater became the president in 1978 and he retired in 1996 after 18 years. And I can get into a little more detail of what they did. Okay, now what I want to do is, is give you a feel in my own career for the, how contemporary our knowledge is. I've already indicated that I first went to the National Cancer Institute to study cancer in 1955. And the, because I had been trained as a hematologist, and by the way, I've got some interesting facts that I looked up today. Uh, does anyone know who George Minot was? Minot and Murphy? Nobody? Dr. Minot was the first American hematologist. He discovered that if you give liver extract by mouth to patients who are dying, dying of pernicious anemia, Pernicious anemia, for those of you who never heard or seen it, is a disease that is the exact analog of cancer. The bone marrow is completely replaced by erythroblasts. The patients develop severe pancytopenia and die horribly. The natural history of the disease was less than a year of survival. It was the exact paradigm of cancer. But it was discovered for a number of, well, the reasons are that uh, it was found that if you bled dogs so they became anemic, they wouldn't recover their hemoglobin unless you fed them liver. And it turned out that what the liver contained was iron. So the studies of iron deficiency anemia led to the giving liver to animals that were anemic. And Dr. Minot Murphy got the idea of feeding raw liver to human beings who had pernicious anemia. And of course, it caused remissions of pernicious anemia. Subsequently, it was found that that is B12 contained in the liver. And now, of course, we give B12 by subcutaneous ingestion, and we give it by mouth. But George Minot was the first American hematologist. And he thought we ought to have a discipline called hematology in this country. It only existed in Europe. And he founded the journal Blood in 1946, the first publication of hematology 
in the United States, 1946. And the first editor-in-chief was William Damashek, and I'll come back to Dr. Damashek later. Um, the first scientific society devoted to hematology was formed in 1958. The American Society of Hematology, 1958. Now you can put that in context here. You can see that's three years after I went to the Cancer Institute. And I was present at the first founding meeting of the American Society of Hematology. It was organized with 100 hematologists who met in Boston and decided we needed a society. Now, while we were working in NIH from 55 to 65, we were doing all this research on leukemia and cancer. And we'd present our research at the American Society of Hematology. And what happened is the Hematology Society was dominated by classical hematologists who did coagulation, uh, genetics of hemoglobin, you know, all the classical hematology. And the leukemia papers tended to get shoved off to the last afternoon when there are very few people there. So we felt increasingly that at the American Association for Cancer Research, the clinical papers were put on the very last day, so we got very poor publicity. At ASH, the leukemia papers were put to the very last day. So a number of us got together and decided we needed a society of oncology. And the first American Society for Clinical Oncology meeting was held in 1964, 40 years ago. We had our 40th anniversary this year at the annual meeting. The society was organized with 66 members, and at the first meeting we had 50. In 2004, the society has over 20,000 members, from 66 to 20,000 from 64 to 40 years. And the annual meeting attracts about 26,000 attendees in contrast to 100. Gives you an idea how rapidly things change. Oncology is now one of the major specialties in internal medicine, as you know. OK, we became uh, very important in ASCO because uh, a lot of our research here at MD Anderson went in this bridging area, and we published it at the we presented at the American Society for Clinical Oncology. By 1968, Dr. Fry, our chairman, was the fifth president. We had the 69 meeting here in Houston of the American Society for Clinical Oncology. In 1976, I gave the seventh Karnofsky lecture. In 1980, I became the 17th president, and so on. Okay. Now the other thing I want to point out is here's Fry leaving in 72. The first examination for boards in medical oncology was in 1973. And today, medical oncology is the third largest certif board certified subspecialty in medicine, 1973. Okay. Now let me run through some of the more contemporary things that happened to me. Again, it's in the context of your knowing how contemporary our knowledge is. When I started working on leukemia in 1955, like anyone who does research, I went to the library to look at the latest publications. And the most authoritative publications came from Dr. Wintrobe, who was the author of the textbook of hematology. And his group, the senior author was Arthur Hout, had published a paper in 1955 where I was right up to date. And this is the conclusion. It wasn't possible to demonstrate that the newer therapies increased the total survival in patients with leukemia. So our first research was done to show that chemotherapy induces complete remissions. We had objective criteria. We showed that complete remissions were a surrogate for survival. And we showed that, in fact, the patients who respond had significant increases in survival. So that happened in the decade from 55 to 65. This is the way it was in 55. Median lifespan of these children was measured in weeks. Uh, in fact, the median survival was about three months. 100% mortality by one year. And as you know today, 85% of children are cured with chemotherapy. When we came to MD Anderson, uh, 
I moved my attention from children to adults with leukemia, and we tried to apply the multiple agent chemotherapy, which cured children with leukemia, to adults with myeloblastic leukemia. And we actually observed a 25% objective complete remission rate, and we sent this paper off to the famous journal Blood, 1965. And this is taken, it was rejected by the journal, and I love this critique. I, I, almost, I love to read it every time. I pulled it out of my files. The treatment they proposed is drastic. You know, these are people who are going to die in three months. Drastic treatment. There's also an irritating quality to the writing. <laughs> the use of acronyms for drug combinations is amusing, but it seems excessive efforts for the results they report. Now, it's important that these, we invented these acronyms, and now every multiple aging chemotherapy regimen in the world has an acronym. So although it irritated the editor and the reviewer, it, it became very important. These are going to have the acceptance of radar, laser, or waves. <laughs> they exhibit a devious talent, inappropriate in a scientific report. Well, anyhow, we got the paper published eventually, but <laughs> not in that journal. OK. Uh, Dr. Damashek was the famous editor-in-chief, founding editor of the journal Blood, and he wrote an editorial when he published this paper. Not only is this med <laughs> method unscientific, but the initial toxic reaction can be lethal. Furthermore, it's not been shown that it offers significant advantage. In general, they may be thought to represent groupings. I like that. Which engender a little enthusiasm for long-term advantages. Of course, Dr. Damashek was wrong as skeptics tend to be. And pomp is still used today. Well, after all that editorial business, the next thing was the medical community at large rose up. And Dr. Crosby was a world famous hematologist, past president of ASH. And we actually had a debate on the stage of the American College of Physicians. Should adults with acute leukemia be treated with these horrible toxic drugs? Remember, median survival untreated three months, 100% mortality one year. Dr. Crosby said it should be used only sparingly since treatment may be killing more than they realize. And then there's a quote from me. And these are just the quotes, so you can read them a little better. But the point is, this was published in Medical World News, which was the big throwaway of the day. And uh, I only want to make the point that the gropings of trying to approach metastatic cancer with systemic treatment was very reluctantly accepted by the academic medical community. Now, the other thing we worked on here, uh, I'll just tell you this tale to show you how difficult it is to get things going. When we were at NIH, we worked out the platelet transfusion method. And when we went to, and we controlled hemorrhage to a very large degree, as you do today, the methods you use today were the methods I developed in 1960, 40 years later. They're not substantially better. Equipment's a little better. Freeze's technique's a little better, but basically the same principles. You get an increment of 12,500 for every unit of platelets from a volunteer donor. And when we went to control infection, we realized that granulocytes were very different than platelets. Platelets have a half-life of 10 days. Granulocytes have a half-life of six hours. And so the dose that is required to control infection with granulocytes was enormous. So we decided that we had to develop some equipment which could process the entire blood volume of a donor and recover all the granulocytes because your blood volume contains approximately uh, 10 to the 12 granulocytes. But as you know, the granulocytes are very readily mobilized from the bone marrow. And so we developed a continuous flow blood cell separator in collaboration with IBM. We left NIH before the instrument was completed, and they manufactured three of these machines and gave us one to evaluate at MD Anderson. And this is a very historic picture because the machine, as you see, is a very is a claptrap instrument compared to what you would see if you go to the research center today. It has a bunch of tubes and lines, and you see all the bags hanging up there. And, and uh, we had to put this all together, prime the whole thing with saline to be sure there was no air in the lines. And then we had to roll the whole thing to the bedside. And this is the first patient we ran. 
and you could see the blood coming in. It came in through the centrifuge and was returned except for the Buffy coat, which was skimmed down. And this instrument actually became commercially available after we worked out all the physical dynamics. But to show you how difficult it was to operate at MD Anderson, this was done in my laboratory, a regular lab, and we had to roll it to the bedside and do this procedure that way. Finally, Dr. Clark decided that we could use the kitchen on the pediatric floor. There was a little uh, dietetic kitchen, and we purchased a second instrument, and now we had two machines, and we used this kitchen, uh, which was converted to a phoresis donor room, and we didn't have to go to the bedside. We could bring the patients to the donor facility and uh, do them there. And uh, that picture was taken in the kitchen. And uh, the machine was very complicated. We had to take it all apart and put it all together by hand. It all had to be scrubbed to get rid of the pyrogens and sterilized by gas, and the screws had to be put in with a screwdriver. Very primitive. Today it's all a disposable deal and easy to do if you ever go to the Friesen Center. Uh, the second thing we tried to do is we were becoming aware of the germ-free technology was developing largely at NASA. And uh, it had been shown that in a germ-free animal, they could, the LD50 of radiation and chemotherapy was approximately doubled. So we thought it might be a good idea to try to sterilize a person, a patient. And we started with a unit that we called a life island. And it was actually a plastic bubble containing a bed. And we could access this plastic bubble through those chambers, which were sterile chambers, with UV sterilized in the chamber. And then the patient would take things out the other end. We actually had uh, some physicians on the staff went to Dr. Clark and said we were torturing people by putting them in this terrible place. We actually had patients who lived inside this bubble for 100 days while they were getting intensive chemotherapy for their leukemia. But it proved to be quite effective. Uh, the incidence of, in, of life-threatening infection and the mortality were reduced by 100%. So we decided to pursue this technology and the next step was to import from the NASA people a technology which is called laminar airflow. And the basis of the laminar airflow is that now, instead of a bubble, you have a room where the incoming air is all particle free. We use high efficiency particle filters to remove all the particles. And the air flows horizontally across the room in a laminar fashion so that any organisms that enter the room are swept out of the rear of the room. And now you're looking at the incoming air heading toward a patient in a laminar airflow room. And Dr. Clark actually allowed us to destroy a three-bedroom ward on 3 West, the old hospital, and to build two laminar airflow rooms in actual rooms uh, in the hospital. And, that's, and that proved to be quite successful. And the consequence of that is we subsequently induced a manufacturer to make a portable laminar airflow room. That is, it was an actual box which had gauntlets so that you could access the patient. And the laminar flow went through this. It was an actual room. The box was put inside of a room. And since we didn't have any room at MD Anderson Hospital, we rented an apartment building across the street, which was called, it's no longer there, it's been torn down. And, we, and a patient donated four of these units to us. And we had a protected environment unit in this center pavilion hospital. And then, of course, when we finally got the money to open the Lutheran Pavilion, uh, Dr. Clark agreed to build a laminar airflow protected environment on the 12th floor. And that unit uh, was operated until we opened the uh, green zone, the ALCAC. And this is a picture of the laminar airflow facility on the 12th floor. And that's Dr. Bodie, who was the pioneer in doing all this, of the Lutheran Pavilion. We had uh, 16 beds on a nursing unit arranged in the usual pod structure like the Lutheran Pavilion. And the patients were accessed either sterilely by entering the room or by gauntlets. And they had access to their family through windows. Now this technology proved to be so successful 
that when the uh, ALCAC hospital was built, you all may not realize that the ALCAC hospital is engineered so that all the airflow is HEPA filtered. The air that the patients received in their room is all particle free and the flow in the, in the ALCAC is from the patient's room out to the nursing station and to the corridor. So that the patients in the ALCAC hospital all have sterile air, which has substantially reduced uh, nosocomial infection in our institution. In addition to that, on the 12th floor, we have a modern uh, protected environment unit in the ALCAC, which used the HEPA filtration, but also has isolated rooms with limited access for staff and family so that the patients actually have a sterile environment, which is used for the transplant patients, leukemia patients, and other patients who are severely myelosuppressed. Okay, well, uh, POMP was uh, kind of radical and it wasn't very smart, but it turned out that by 19, what year? What well, was about 1985 uh, or so, we had already demonstrated that at MD Anderson Cancer Center, there were more adults with acute myeloblastic leukemia who'd been alive for five years than were present in the world's literature, just at MD Anderson. And we published this paper, Michael Keating was the, the first author. And uh, as you know, we still at this point cure approximately 30% of those patients. Now I'm gonna give you, uh, since this is a core curriculum, I just wanted to get away from history and give you a little more perspective on what's happening in the cancer field. Others will probably talk about this, but it's just a little bit of a quickie overview. Uh, I think you all know that heart disease is the leading cause of death if you consider all-cause mortality, but I think you all realize that heart disease has dramatically decreased as a cause of death because of the advances in prevention, cancer tr uh, treatment, bypass surgery, uh, cholesterol control, and so on. If you divide the po population above and below 65, you'll notice that in the younger population, cancer is now the leading cause of death because heart disease has fallen more than 40% in the 20 year period, 73 to 93, and is still going down. Now, the decrease in heart disease is not that dramatic in the elderly, but it is still dramatic and the mortality from cancer is still slightly going up. It was at least in, uh, in 93, but I'll show you more detailed data. So for the elderly, cancer is not the leading cause of death, it is the second cause of death, but heart disease and cancer apply for most of the life shortening events in populations over the age of 65. Now I think you're all aware of the fact, these are data from 70 to 87, but the same thing is true for 94. You're aware of the demographics in the United States and the demographics are that although the population's increased overall 20%, the population over 85 has more than doubled. And if you look at the Census Bureau figures from the uh, Census Bureau official report, it is now established that the most rapidly growing segment of our population is centenarians. And by the year 2050, and there's no question this will happen. This is not an estimate. This will certainly be the case if nothing changes. Two people in a thousand will be over a hundred. So the centenarians will make up two tenths of a percent of the entire population. And they are, as you can see, the most rapidly growing segment of the American population. Now that's important because you all aware of the fact that cancer is strongly, cancer incidence is strongly age associated. Now these are tables on life expectancy and you know that life expectancy at birth has changed dramatically in the last 100 years. This graph is from 1900 to 1980 and you can see that the major change in life expectancy is due to control of infant mortality, uh, diseases of the young, but for the elderly, particularly over 50, life expectancy has not changed in a major way, largely because of the two things that I showed you already. And to put this in more contemporary things, you know, it's always impressed me 
to stop and think that the life expectancy at birth in Rome was 15 years because of the enormous uh, infectious disease mortality, newborn mortality. In Egypt, 29 years. In England, 1426 to 1450, only 500 years ago, expected lifespan at birth was 33 years, less than half of what it is today. 1600s in France. And in Massachusetts, in the 1900s, it was 36 years. So in 100 years, our life expand, lifespan estimated at birth, expectation of life, is more than double in 100 years. What's going to happen in the next 100 years? Well, this is one of my pet theories. You know, uh, what's been happening is that the major causes of early mortality have been eliminated. <coughs> and we're pushing the centenarian age. The oldest recorded human with a birth certificate is probably 120 or 125, somewhere around there. So the question is, do humans have a finite lifespan or will, in fact, this keep going? We'll never control trauma, of course. People, there are suicide, homicide, auto accidents. Can't do anything about that. We're trying, but from disease. Well, that's not known, as you know. And I once had a debate with uh, a telomere physiologist who said, <coughs> it's in our genes. You know, there's a theory that take all species of animals, fish, rodents, humans, we all have lifespans, which are characteristic of our species. And for a long time, it was believed this is genetic. It has to do with shortening the telomeres or whatever. It's in your genes. You can only live so long and then you die of something, old age. Of course, being a doctor, you know no one dies of old age. We've never seen that. Everybody dies of disease. So the question is, is there a finite lifespan in the human that is in our genes? And there's a very important publication in science last year. Uh, the group in Sweden, which has got absolute <coughs> life table vital statistics, has demonstrated that the longest we can live is progressively increasing so that if you're to project from the past there is no finite lifespan for man at least it cannot be established scientifically something for you to think about and of course i have to close with our number one cancer problem and that is lung cancer you're all aware of the epidemiology which showed that as soon as <coughs> men started smoking in 1900 cancer of lung followed as soon as women started smoking in the 30s and 40s, cancer followed. And as you know, now it's true that <coughs> the mortality from cancer of the lung is higher in women than cancer of the breast, which has been fairly stable over the years while lung cancer goes up with smoking. And I, one of my favorite covers of the ACS magazine is this one. You know, you've come a long way, baby. <laughs> That's where they've come. We've got to do something about smoking in women. Uh, the efforts to control smoking really began with uh, <coughs> the first reports that there was an association between lung cancer and smoking. Subsequently, the Surgeon General established that there was a causal relationship when it was shown experimentally to exist. <coughs> and as you know, in the United States, the per, per capita consumption of tobacco is going down, but it's still very high. Smoking in adolescent, in young American females is still increasing in incidence, but in males it is going down progressively. And I'm ready to close my talk by telling you what I've tried to say in my talk is that all of the things we call knowledge is very contemporary. It's all occurred in the last 200 years. Science is only 100 years old. Everything that I learned in my 50-year career is contemporary knowledge. So if you sit here and say to yourself, what's going to happen in the next 100 years? Well, if you're a lay person, most lay people, you know, will always have airplanes, will always have cars. Remember Jimmy Carter said we're going to run out of 
petroleum. He forgot we didn't have any petroleum 100 years ago. It's normal for lay people to be unimaginative and not be able to imagine what's going to happen in the future. Scientists, of course, have done what I've tried to do for you. You have a feel for how contemporary knowledge is. So you're likely to extra extrapolate into the future, and you'll say, well, for sure, changes in the next 100 years might be about as fast as they were in the last 100 years. But of course, that's not the case at all. The fact of the matter is that everything that involves knowledge and scientific progress is exponential. It's proportional to the amount of knowledge we have now that the pace of knowledge occurs. And the people who predict the future most accurately are science fiction writers. These are very creative, imaginative people who can imagine that we would land on the moon, that we're going to plant it, we're going to occupy space, that we're going to control cancer. The control of cancer will be a major life prolonging event when we succeed in doing it. We've already done it for the young, we've got to do it for the old. So that's the end of my talk, and I'm free to take questions or angry comments. happened already. If you're a scholar and you're up on the le literature, I've just written an editorial on this subject, which we sent to the New England Journal. I don't think it'll be published. It's too controversial. But uh, it's already been established that the in melanoma, you can distinguish between melanomas which are going to remain local and melanomas which are going to metastasize by their molecular patterns by gene expression profiling. In other words, there are specific patterns of gene expression that are associated with systemic cancers. Secondly, cancers which metastasize are undoubtedly systemic from the very beginning. The idea that cancers begin locally, regionally, and systemically is an, anti an outdated idea. This, the metastatic cancers are probably systemic from the beginning. And the literature is now full of facts which indicate two things. When you learn more about cell biology in this core curriculum, you'll realize that the differentiation from the embryonic stem cell is not hierarchical. That's the way we used to think. We, we now know that many of these differentiation schemes can be reversed. Many differentiated cells can revert to a less di differentiated stem cell type. And that means that every cell retains the DNA content to make any organ. And it's now shown that there is this trans development, that is that epithelial cells can become mesothelial cells. And as you know, there the group working here has shown that after transplant, cells which are injected from hematopoietic cells can occur in liver, heart, and other organs. So this trans differentiation and non-hierarchical differentiation already here. And I think this is technology is definitely the way cancer is going to go. We're going to study cancer and understand its biology so that we'll know how to treat it and control it. Anyone else want to say something controversial? I said a lot of stuff that should be controversial, but may not be. Anyone else want to say anything? We got 15 minutes. Comments are welcome too. You're on the brink. To ask you what you, you consider the most uh, compelling discovery or transition in the last decade. Last decade? Yeah. Or during your career for that matter. Oh boy. Because you mentioned the fact that you know evolution is now exponential. But what do you think ultimately? Well, 
I think uh, I think that we now recognize that cancer is a disorder, proliferation, differentiation, and these are all regulated processes. So I don't think we will ever have a time when there is no cancer. I have a lot of people who say to me, you're building this huge institute and you're doubling, we're adding 40% of our square footage in the next two years. We're increasing 140% in square footage, building the clinic building and our research building. Isn't Anderson, you know, cancer will be controlled and it'll all go away. Cancer will never go away because we're a very complex multicellular organism and I think cancer is a consequence of disorder in proliferation differentiation. We'll always have that, no matter how good our treatments are, but we will be able to control cancer. We will be able to modulate it. We'll, we'll be able to convert uh, lethal cancers into controllable cancers. I use the analogy of diabetes. We'll eventually learn to control diabetes, but in the meantime, we've had 50 years where insulin has been able to control the disease so the lifespan approaches normal. And if you take care of your lipid metabolism and so on, and the same thing is true of heart disease. We haven't eliminated atherosclerosis, but we've come a long way. Stroke has almost disappeared if we pay attention to hypertension, we pay attention to cholesterol. Those diseases are still present, but we can control them when we learn how to modulate them. And I think that's the way cancer will go. We'll, the other important point about cancer is the better our treatment, the more the problem. I mean, I told you when I started treating adults with acute leukemia at MD Anderson, 1965, in the decade before I got here, 55 to 65, there were 100 patients with AML referred to this institution, adults. In 2004, we had 1,000 patients with leukemia <laughs> referred to this institution. So things have really changed. And what's changed is instead of dying in three months, the median lifespan now is over a year, and 30% live for five years. So all of those patients are patients for life. So our clinic, in addition to new patients, keeps growing. It's a general rule that once you have a malignancy, the likelihood of a second malignancy is significantly increased because there is this field effect. If you have a skin cancer and you have it removed surgically, the likelihood of a second primary is higher than in the general population. If you have a curable melanoma, the likelihood of a second is higher. If you have colon cancer, if you have any malignancy, the likelihood of a second malignancy is higher because you've already had initiating events and it's obviously it takes multiple changes to convert a normal cell to a malignant cell. So I think we'll always have cancer and the better we get at it, the more cancer there will be. There are 400,000 Americans are gonna die this year. There are a million new diagnoses every year. So we're gonna have a cancer problem forever, so don't worry about getting out of business. <laughs> the better we are, the better, the more we're needed. It's generally true of medicine, as you know. Medicine has boomed in the last 50 years. Antibiotics hasn't eliminated infectious diseases, but it has controlled them. So now we have uh, organisms resistant. We have organisms in our hospital resistant to every known antibiotic for which we are still working on getting them. But those organisms occur five, 10 years later than the ones that used to kill people at the beginning. So there are always problems ahead of us, regardless of how much progress we make. But you gotta remember, we'll be in a whole new world uh, in 50 years. So it's important for you guys to stay alert because you got this, you know, we don't practice medicine because everything you learned is gonna be outdated in a decade. We have to, we're a scholarly degree, the doctor of medicine, and we have to continue to expand our skills and knowledge based on what's known about the diseases we're treating. And it changes quickly. Anyone else wanna ask anything? or make a statement, comment. Shy group. Thank you all for coming.